we have a panel discussion. And to chair the session, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. S. Narayan, visiting senior research fellow at Institute of South Asian Studies and former economic advisor to the Prime Minister of India, fellow panelist, panelist Mr. Bharat Rajesh Joshi, Director Joshi Group J Curve, India, Ms. Karuna Gopal, founding president at the Foundation for Futuristic Cities, India, and Dr. Francis Chong, Senior Director, Emerging Markets Division, and Amaravati Partnership Office, Ministry of Trade and Industry, Singapore. May I invite the panelists on stage, please? Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, continuing this uh, theme of infrastructure and uh, smart cities, we have a group of uh, very distinguished people here, and uh, just will speak half a minute to introduce all of you. Their CVs are already there. Half a minute to just uh, introduce them. Bharat Joshi is uh, uh, associated with a number of infrastructure initiatives in India. He is the uh, company of the Joshi Group as executive director and has, has, will be talking about primarily infrastructure uh, activities that are going on in India. Uh, Karuna, of course, heads a, a futuristic foundation of futuristic cities, and she's passionately working from Hyderabad on trying to define the concept of a smart cities and taking it further than merely building and construction. And uh, my friend Lawrence, of course, has had considerable experience on the ground in Amaravati in the last uh, few years and taking this idea forward. I think what uh, we thought we would like to do is to take it beyond the earlier dis discussion on the hardware of the smart city, the construction and the technology idea, and move over in this panel, if possible, much more from the recipient's point of view. What exactly does it mean for the citizen? What exactly does a smart city deliver to the citizen, which is different from just buildings? And if there is something that the citizen can aspire to, can we build it around the concept of how exactly the smart cities are going to be configured and to take this story, we, we, we would start with Karuna, with her, with her ideas, go with Lawrence with his experiences, and Bharat would tie it down to what he thinks, how this, thinks that this can be done. So, Karuna first. Thank you, Dr. Narayana. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, thank you very much for having me here this afternoon. Um, I'm here to talk about the concept of a smart city and basically try to demystify the entire concept. I very much loved the presentation given by the minister, Lawrence Wong. Um, he uh, really gave a fantastic perspective on what a smart city is. But what you will hear from me would completely be different from what you heard from him because my perspective will touch upon the uh, South Asian reality. India, Nepal, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, perhaps. So I would say that a time has come, a time has come for this particular region to revisit its assumptions on what a smart city is, reconfigure the plants that they made so far, and also perhaps recast their aspirations. Now, why am I saying this? Let me just explain. In the last two decades, a lot has been discussed about smart cities and cities in general. Regions, cities around the world have come out with their own definitions. Some call them green cities, some call them intelligent cities, some call them circular cities, some call them digital cities, and there's been enormous amount of confusion in terms of what is a smart city. 
that is as far as the definition is concerned. Now, let me talk about the landscape itself. In the last two decades, the entire landscape, smart city landscape, has been littered with jargon. We initially started with sensors, then we moved to smart sensors, geolocation devices, big data, um, Internet of Things, connected Internet of Things, then cloud. Uh, we talked about bleeding edge and cutting edge technologies, then now we are talking about fog computing. The entire landscape is absolutely littered with jargon and it just does confuse people. Another thing happened in South Asia especially, people started looking at smart cities only through the lens of either technology or real estate or investments. And that's exactly where we made mistakes. What happened now if you categorically, I was taking a, a review of what happened in the last one and a half decades in this region. We built ghost cities. There are cities that are built but are not occupied. If you see in China, that is the same. We created enormous amount of hype and expectations around cities. We uh, created trust deficit. People don't believe anymore when you say you're creating a smart city. We created non-performing assets. These are the things that went wrong in the region in the last one and a half decades. The wake-up call came from China. When China went through economic low, a bit of a depression, it approached IMF, the International Monetary Fund, for getting the required finances. And I remember Christine Lagarde in one of the interviews categorically told China, we don't mind giving you the money, we will loan you the money, but don't put it in marquee infrastructure, don't build airports, don't build glass and steel. Put your money in governance. Put your money, clean up your institutions, put your money in reform. So this is fundamentally how we have to start looking at smart cities today. There are three, three very important things for the region of South Asia. The first thing, we have to look at not just the hard infrastructure, but the soft infrastructure, like governance, reforms, customer centricity. In this case, it is a citizen centricity. Put the, cen put the citizen right at the center and create your infrastructure for his requirement. Create services for his requirement. Now, this is the first thing that has to be done. The second learning for us is smart cities have to be customized. They have to be country-centric. For instance, we can't, um, just because a London has a London data store, it doesn't mean that we should have. Just because another country is going for 5G, I may not need it. Now, this has been amply proved recently when you saw what happened at the World Economic Forum. Almost six to seven heads of countries have not even attended the World Economic Forum this time for the simple reason that they had pressing national issues to attend to. So increasingly, you have to start looking inward and see what your country needs and what your city needs. And the third and the most important thing is about contextualization. Smart cities have to be contextualized. Again, come to the absolute requirements of what your city needs. Just, just to give an example, I remember once an, uh, an Australian delegation came to Hyderabad, I mean India, and they said that we are using drones to take care of our farmlands. Stop and think, it is not useful for India. Because in farmlands, the unit of a farm is runs into hectares in Australia. In India, it's a minor, a few, one or two acres. We don't need drones there. The same thing recently, someone said that India's health profile mimics United States profile in the sense we have NCDs, non-communicable diseases. So they were, they were saying that our smart cities should look at NCDs, but we realize now our infectious disease profile matches Bangladesh. So we need, to, we need to really understand how to customize and put it there. So the most important thing I'd like to say at this point, before I forget, is that smart cities, as I said, have to be contextualized, and I can prove it today that if you look at the AI policy, the artificial intelligence policy for cities, you see that the first thing, you see that US and China are investing in military, customized. You see AI policy for Japan, it is for productivity. AI policy for Singapore, building talent. AI policy for Germany, building life, work-life balance. 
for France, it's environment. For India, it's inclusion. So you can see the amount of customization that is happening, the technology deployment, and the same has to happen in the case of cities and smart cities. So let's not ape the West, and that is my advice to the Southeast, South Asian countries on how they approach the smart city plans. Wonderful. Wonderful. Lawrence on experience. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Narayan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for still being here. It's already a long day. Uh, before I start, I have to say, since I'm on camera, that I'm, a, of course, at the Ministry of Trade and Industry, but in this particular session, I'm only speaking in my personal capacity and not on behalf of the government of Singapore. Um, I just want to make a, share a few things that I would like to maybe term it Reflections from five years of working on Amaravati, the uh, capital city of uh, Andhra Pradesh. So I'm not really going to talk about Amaravati. I think somebody asked uh, Jonathan Yap the question earlier today. But some reflections uh, on the experience and what it might mean for infrastructure and smart cities. So the first reflection I'd like to share is that I think that we cannot have smart cities without smart citizens, right? I mean, it seemed quite apparent to me. And I met so many smart people uh, who taught me many things. Some of them left me smarting, but mostly uh, by working with them, I became smarter. And I thought it filled me with a great sense of hope and optimism it didn't really matter where cities were or whether it's greenfield or where it starts or how, you know, maybe uh, in, in some form of disrepair. But so long as people in the city, the citizens, were open to learning and want to do better, things will get better. Things get smarter, right? So it got me thinking about what then might be some ways in which a city could be developed, what kind of infrastructure could, could help citizens to become smarter. And there are many ways. I mean, Minister Lawrence shared many things, and I, I, I don't really want to go into the hardware and the technology. I wanted to share just two, two things. And the first, I thought, uh, and since there are many students uh, in the audience, I suppose all of us, if we are in lifelong learning, are students of one form or another, uh, is this hunger for knowledge and openness to whoever has knowledge and is prepared to share. And that's how we ended up in uh, Andhra Pradesh. We were invited by the government to share what Singapore has gained from our own developmental experience. And this openness is not just to foreigners, but also to internal movement of people. And one of the best ways to, to learn from each other is, in fact, to live together. And of course, uh, that then goes into design. And this morning, we heard a little bit about affordable housing and different kinds of housing. Uh, in fact, one of the things that we tried to share a lot was about public housing and public housing for a large proportion of the population so that you get a lot more social mixing. And in that mixing is an opportunity, so long as people are open, to learn from each other and become smarter, and in that way, support the development of a smarter city. The second thing, uh, which perhaps is uh, more practical, was the discovery that, in fact, a very small investment in a particular type of social infrastructure could have disproportionate returns. And here I'm talking about public libraries. Uh, public libraries are kind of almost taken for granted here in Singapore. We find them in the malls and because we have our national library. And, you know, they are a wonderful resource for extending learning resources even to the poorest uh, part of our population. Right? And they don't cost very much. So I, I went to look at our national library board's uh, budget for the year. Uh, I have some statistics to share, which actually should be quite encouraging. We have three and a half million citizens in Singapore, or maybe five and a half million uh, residents. The National Library Board has two and a half million members. 
Uh, they made 26 million visits per year in 2017, 31 mi million loans per year. Uh, in terms of digital downloads, it was almost 80 million. And the best part was that the National Library Board only cost us $250 million a year. That sounds like a lot until you divide it by the population. And that's like 20 cents per person per day to have that wonderful National Library. So uh, I visited libraries in uh, India. I think some of them could certainly do with some improvement. But again, I left with a great sense of optimism and hope because I found librarians who were very creative, who wanted to do things within the limited resources they had. Right? They were organizing reading weeks. They were order organizing reading camps for young people. Right? They invited uh, people with certain types of experience to come and be human books to share their experiences with the audience because maybe the collection was not as rich as they could have wanted. So there was this strong desire to want to learn. And I believe that, you know, well, there are not so many members in the audience now, but for those who are diaspora, that this was one of the things which, in fact, we could contribute back to home societies or home countries, which is to support the movement of uh, or restoration or rejuvenation of public libraries. So I'll just leave it at that and end up by saying that if we want to be smart, we should learn to live better and learn to live together. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, members of the House who stayed on. It's a long day, and you're still here, so you certainly are still members of the House and not embers of the House. Um, I'll just continue what my fellow panelists said, and I'll focus on um, one of the uh, three main topics keynote speaker, senior minister spoke of this morning, and that is of connectivity infrastructure. And connectivity infrastructure, as uh, you are aware, is essential for linkages within our cities, for enabling rapid urbanization, and for integrating, uh, at least in my case, India, with the regional value chains. Uh, but let me begin with the human connectivity, which is only apt, given that this is a diaspora conference. Um, and this human connectivity, this human bridge, as it's sometimes called, is... Uh, I think, uh, enabled by this huge asset of the Indian diaspora. The, uh, the prolific Indian diaspora is well known. You're aware that the CEOs of global companies like Microsoft, Google, Adobe, and MasterCard are of Indian origin. And of course, as was Freddie Mercury of Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, this deep and uh, vast uh, Indian diaspora can provide a ready enabler for joint projects in many geographies. So in other words, partnerships. So that's why this human connectivity is important for how it lends itself to enable partnerships. Now speaking from personal experience, um, and we work with some Japanese companies, the Japanese have successfully used India as a launch pad for other regions as far as the African continent. Panasonic, for instance, has based its uh, regional operations for all of Africa, the GCC or Middle East, and for, the sub or the, uh, and for the Indian subcontinent in India. So that's well over two billion per people market. Um, so has Daikin, so has Suzuki and some others. And now India and Japan are looking at third countries in which and with which to cooperate. And this, to my mind, is perhaps one of the huge opportunities for us to cooperate with Singapore and other ASEAN partners. Um, the two prime ministers of India and Japan have articulated that connectivity infrastructure should be developed and used in an open, transparent, and non-exclusive manner based on international standards, responsible debt financing, and putting this concept of quality infrastructure to work um, there already are projects on the ground. In Bangladesh, for instance, India will construct roads while Japan will provide bridges to connect these roads. Uh, Japan will construct the Jamuna Railway Bridge on which Indian rolling stock will ply. In Myanmar, both, both partners will align housing, schools, and electricity projects. In Sri Lanka, the two countries are cooperating with Sri Lanka for development of 
LNG-related infrastructure. And in Kenya, India and Japan are jointly working towards developing a cancer hospital as well as supporting SMEs. Now, within this part of the world, not Africa, you will already have noticed that India has land borders with much of these uh, South Asian countries, uh, Burma, sorry, uh, Myanmar, which is ASEAN, but then Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal, um, among others. So the opportunities are limitless. Uh, on digital connectivity, again, especially in these CLMV countries, India has been uh, doing a bit. It's still in the initial stages, but we have made uh, a beginning. Um, again, with this connectivity alliance or with further infrastructure alliances, there are, there's so much to be done. Uh, we could, with ASEAN partners and with, for instance, New Zealand and Australia, work in the Pacific Islands. Um, the ASEAN in itself is, you know, still in many ways, I think, uh, an unexplored world. I mean, we, of course, have a huge diaspora, huge uh, cultural connect, you know, and, and still uh, there's so much more that can be done. Um, I think I'll end here for now. I have several points to speak on, but I'll leave some more for discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I think the, the, as you would have seen, the story on this panel is a little bit different from what the, uh, what the earlier group presented, the minister presented. And perhaps there are, these are the two sides of a reality. One side is, uh, is, is Singapore, which is a technologically highly advanced, well integrated, uh, digitally connected and, and uh, I would say an advanced society which is uh, seeking to look at the frontiers of, of, uh, uh, of the capabilities of, of all this innovation to make it more useful for governance as well as for citizens. Whereas, whereas in this panel, we are coming from a much, much more very different environment, an environment where I would say the basic structure of infrastructure for citizens access even I would say, access to knowledge, to technology has yet to be built. And therefore the concept would definitely be very, very different. So on that note, uh, can I open the, op open the floor for, for some questions? Because these are, this is, this is a constant debate. What exactly is a smart city? This lady at the back, please. Thanks very much for that uh, really interesting panel discussion. I want to put a proposition to you all that actually we don't have smart cities. What we have is a series of smart projects. And the because of that, they are inherently exclusionary and inclusionary. And I want to pose two things to you. One of them is the kind of exclusionary, like if you go to Bangalore, um, they have far better connectivity to, uh, you know, in internet um, hardware connectivity to outside uh, India than within Bangalore. So there's kind of geographic variations in terms of exclus exclusivity and inclusivity. And the second one I want to pose is one of that is that most of these forms of um, inclusivity have been focusing on production. So they're looking at the male work or the, or the area of uh, arena of work, of paid work. Whereas actually does that, uh, what are the you know, possibilities of including women into this program? Good question. Uh, would you like to, I think this is, all three would have comments on it. Go ahead. Um, I think what you mentioned at the beginning is an observation, so I'll leave it at that. But uh, um, including women is, is is a great suggestion. In fact, uh, when my prime minister mooted the 100 Smart Cities mission, uh, we worked on a very exhaustive report on um, smart cities and inclusion, where we said that uh, there are four sections of society that are never included. One is um, you know the senior citizens, the other is women, the differently abled and um, and the poor so we worked on uh, on these and decided how how we could integrate them there's one particular example i'd like to share that city uh, in vienna something extremely interesting was done there the government asked men and women about how they use the infrastructure that is the roads men said we go to office and we come back but women said we go to, we get up in the morning, we take our uh, pets for walk, we drop our children in the schools, we come back, we buy groceries, then we take our elderly to elderly care, or doctors, etc. 
women use the same infrastructure in a different way. So Vienna used what we call as the gender lens to look at the city design and they incorporated the desires and you know the wishes of women and came out with a gender friendly city and today it um, it stands as an example for many others to follow so thanks for alerting us i think the whether it's smart projects or smart cities uh, i suppose smart cities you would distinguish it from smart projects in terms of the coverage and the scale and inclusivity. I, I don't think exclusion is the necessary outcome of a smart project. I mean, unless you have a green field and you design from scratch and you master plan it from scratch. Um, if you are in a brownfield or existing city, you, you start and also you have budget constraints. and So you start with a project as a pilot, but whether it, it's exclusionary or not, I think it all starts in the, in, in the mind, right? I mean, if we design it and in our mind, we think of, we, we segment society, segment people into different groups and say, this one, we're not going to take care of, they're out of it. it. The project will come out to be exclu exclusive. But if we start with the idea that we want to include everyone, uh, then the project will turn out that way. So, so it really is the intent but how it starts, I think, is a matter of being pragmatic. You, you rarely get a chance to do something completely tabula rasa. Having said that, I think that, in fact, uh, given the rate of urbanization, and there will be a need for new towns, even if they don't get to the size of cities right away. And all those things are opportunities to do it right from the beginning. And I can tell you that in the master planning that we were doing for Amaravati, there was a lot of attention paid to different groups in society and not just the men getting to work. How people travel, uh, suppose they were young children, so primary schools need to be within walking distance and what would be the, the path, a safe path, well lit, uh, away from traffic with pavement. So, so it is possible to design inclusivity. Will we ever be 100% inclusive? I don't think so, not because just because we have our biases and we overlook things. But this is where the openness in consultation and hearing different views helps us to become more inclusive. So my, my theme really is that we, there isn't really an end point in smart or inclusive. We just become more and become better. And wherever we are, as long as we keep learning and striving, we, we get better, right? Uh, of course, the opposite is exactly true. If I may just... Um, just to add to what Dr. Chong and Ms. Gopal said, um, now since this deals a bit with mobility, uh, a couple of things to bear in mind. Even the more advanced cities in India, uh, in terms of physical infrastructure, Bangalore, for example, the, the case you cited, uh, is still in many ways work in progress. So let us not view the status quo as the end game or the final outcome of you know a long uh, series of uh, infrastructure development. And the other thing, and not just Bangalore, this is about, I think, everything to do with India, that uh, the movement rarely is linear. So even if you try and extrapolate where this is going, it may not necessarily lead us to <laughs> what what really is being worked towards. So and in addition to what uh, you know, my co-panelists said, I just you know, urge you to bear this in mind. Thanks. Any other, any other questions on this? Floor is open. Any, any other thoughts? Yes, please, ma'am. Um, I'm just wondering that, you know, the world population at the rate that it is growing is projected to reach from 7.5 to 9.5 billion people. Um, the pull of the urban infrastructure and services they provide is also very strong. So how does the panel see the future? Is it going to be a completely technologically revolutionized, different kind of uh, cities that we're 
going to offer people or are we going to be left with any rural landscapes as well? And like um, Dr. Chong said that, you know, smart cities are for smart citizens. A lot of this rural community that's now getting attracted to the urban uh, cities and infrastructure is not necessarily technologically as smart or skilled. So what's going to happen to this entire labor force that was used in the rural sector that migrates to the urban uh, cities? And how is urban smart cities prepared to deal with this? Yes, um, I think the, uh, maybe take the technology part first. Uh, technology is definitely going to be a very important part of it, of the solution. Uh, it's, I, think, I think the point that uh, Ms. Kopal is making is that it shouldn't, it's not the end in itself. But it is an enabler and we need that technology if we are to live in denser concentrations. For example, to go high rise. Right? I mean, it takes changes in habits and culture, but I think uh, the experience taught me that urban sprawl is a real threat. Uh, it not only does it have a lot more, a large, much larger carbon footprint, just everything, you just need more of it, more material to build out the infrastructure. So, but the concentration requires the ability to, to govern differently and to govern more, um, well, I suppose, more smart, right, in a more smart fashion. If we can reduce the footprint of the urban um, island or the urban of the city, then in fact we leave behind more space for the rural, for the green. I mean, almost what Minister Lawrence was saying, that despite, I mean, Singapore is one of the most densely populated cities in the world, but we have a lot of green because we have managed to, to concentrate our people and, and into very high-rise, high-density uh, residential areas. And on, on the point about if people move to the city and they're not as skilled, I think we have to look at it from a multi-generational perspective, right? So the first generation that moves in, just like maybe for, for in my case, my parents' generation or my grandparents' generation, they do certain kinds of work, but they get their feet on the first rung of the ladder. And the trick is to, to make sure that there is a ladder, right? That they can put the children in school, there's uh, well-trained teachers, good facilities, and then the next generation does better. And of course, there are a whole bunch of other things. The economy needs to be well. It needs to be open. It needs to be connected. There needs to be prosperity, social policies to share and invest in the next generation. These things don't come by themselves. Uh, they, they come because there is a commitment to inclusivity, to want to, be, to bring in the people who are marginalized. But they come to the city in the first place, not because they, they are sightseeing, I think, because they come because where they come from is even worse or the, or the future looks even more bleak. So they come with hope. And I think if we are humane about it, we will respond in such a way that we build a foundation for a better future. Thank you. Okay. Um, you asked about the migration part. As we see, I'd like to just draw an analogy. I remember a few years ago at the World Economic Forum, there was this discussion that uh, we look at development and uh, the rich and the poor as a pyramid. You know, you have the poorest poor at the bottom and the rich, it's there. But in the recent past, they changed the diagram from uh, a pyramid into a diamond shape. They say the middle, the big bulge that you see in the middle is the middle class. So you find very rich at the top, poor here, but the middle class is, you know, changing. And that's why we find in the housing tenements and nuclear families and, you know, every, there's, a, there's a change everywhere. The same thing is happening in rural and urban. The divide is not as much as, you know, what we see. So people come into cities because they find what we call as the urban advantage. They have schooling, they have uh, education, so they're going to come here. So how we manage this urbanization is something that 
cities have to learn, especially in South Asia. We need to be prepared for that migration. If you want to stall the migration, there's only one way. You rejuvenate the rural hinterland or maybe create those opportunities for them that they don't feel compelled to move to the urban areas. So we did have two such efforts when um, there's something called Pura, we came out with providing urban amenities in rural areas is, is a program of our uh, former president of India, Dr. Abdul Kalam. We attempted it and um, we have not been totally successful. People still want to come here seeking opportunities. Just the way the world cannot stop globalization. So globalization, urbanization, industrialization, motorization, they happen as quadruplets. They come together. So we are not going to fight it. In fact, nobody should fight it. We should gracefully accept it, be prepared for it, plan for housing, plan for clean environment. I think it's all about preparedness. I think there were a couple of elements to your question. And one was perhaps the premise of resources versus demands. And to this end, I remain somewhat optimistic because of what we have witnessed in, in India. So one advantage of being a late adopter is that you get to leapfrog some generations in the evolution of um, not just technology, but let's say consumption. So India in some ways has seen a huge surge in what is called the shared economy. This is the Uber and Airbnb and these, you know, food uh, delivery apps and whatnot. Um, so consumption and, of course, technology and the way we look at it can ease out, I think, significantly the pressure on very finite resources. Yes. Thank you. Uh any other questions? If not, we are fairly close to the end of time. All May right. I ask a question if there are no questions from the house? A question of Dr. Chong. Yeah. In your formidable public library system here, do you have a book by at least a couple of the panelists here? <laughs> <laughs> we have a book by panelists. So he's already marketing his book. <laughs> I don't so, think um, the, a fellow panelist can ask a question of her. Can it's against the rules. <laughs> can I just... Uh, today, so. <laughs> Go ahead. So can I, yeah. Um, just, to, just to let you know, since we are on the topic of uh, South Asia, it's very important to know that South Asia, we have, as much as we see problems in terms of urbanization, motorization, air pollution, diseases, whatever we see, there's a great opportunity in South Asia because South Asia is perhaps the only region that is experiencing all industry, you know, industry one, industry two, industry three, industry four, right? From steam engine to electricity to electronics to the disruptive technologies are coexisting in this area. So when, when they are such a powerful uh, ecosystem is available, any kind of problems can be addressed. So we need to start looking at it as an opportunity rather than a, a big problem. So I would say that innovation ecosystem, if it is fostered, then I think we will, we will really make this region extremely vibrant. Thank you. Thank you very much, panelists. Let's give the panelists a big hand for their, I would say, comments based on their personal experiences. And thank you very much. <laughs>